Shadow banking has more than doubled over the past decade, likely to outgrow the regular banking industry within five years. By how much? No one really knows, since it's not regulated. Estimates start from $50 trillion. Hi, I'm Kavit Tafwai. In this edition of the Economic Divide, we will take a look at this industry and whether it takes too big to fail to a whole new level. Shadow banking, is it legal or just unregulated? Because they don't want to be, um, they don't have to be. There was a lot of attention given right before the crash of six years ago. A $70 trillion industry outpacing regular banks. It was then found that the shadow banking sector had become as large as the regulated banking sector. Shadow banks matter because they're massive. Uh, this is an industry now getting on for $72 trillion. But aren't regular banks doing the shadow banking? The shadow banking system is how all of that takes place, but not in the realm of traditional banks that are signed up to be regulated. Shadow banking, what is it exactly? One definition, the financial intermediaries involved in facilitating the creation of credit across the global financial system whose members are not subjected to regulatory oversight. Did you get that? Well, kind of confusing, isn't it? But it means, very simply, getting credit. So why not use regular banks? First, let's get things going by defining what shadow banking is and isn't. There's a historical reason why um, Federal regulators, in particular the Federal Reserve, has not really tried uh, to publicly focus on the shadow banking system. And one of the reasons for that is that it approved the mergers of entities that became a combination of banks and shadow banks. Banking institutions, financial institutions in general, have to concentrate on what is their core business, which is to finance the real economy. It's a, it's a danger to those banks, but it's a danger that they run right into. Uh, so it's not anything they're trying to avoid. They, they, this is the risk that they want, the high uh, rates of profit from risk that they think they'll get. So there, there wasn't really, um, I don't think, an awareness of how important the non-bank uh, lending activities were growing. In fact, they're growing very rapidly now as well. They've got something called peer-to-peer -peer lending, whereby I, as an investor, can sort of um, lend money directly to companies. Um, so I put my money in, and then they, these companies, what they call peer-to-peer -peer lenders, there's one called Lending Club, and they will make loans on my behalf, and this is growing very rapidly. They have to be back to supporting, not destabilizing the economy back to function instead of dysfunction, back to service and not exclusively profit, forgetting about service. Investors around the world are cheering a move by various central banks to provide cheaper cash for lending purposes as the European debt crisis deepens. I think uh, delay has been the enemy on this throughout, and there's been uh, continuous delay uh, with respect to uh, ensuring adequate uh, supervision of those countries that have fiscal consolidation plans in Europe and need to implement them, and ensuring that that's monitored, watched, and reported on so that there can be confidence of the markets that they're doing what they said they would do. Shadow banking. What is it exactly? It's not a term most people have heard of or are familiar with. Yet, it makes up 25 to 30 percent of the total financial system. So how large is 25 to 30 percent? To give you an idea, well, it's kind of hard to actually pinpoint an exact figure, since this is a largely unregulated industry, hence the term shadow banking. Some estimates have it at $60 trillion in 2010, having grown from an estimated $27 trillion in 2002. That's according to the Financial Stability Board, FSB, a regulatory task force for the world's group of 20 
economies or the G20. Now, there was a blip in 2008. You're familiar with that. It made the shadow banking industry decline in scope and volume due to the financial crisis, but it has since returned to its pre-crisis peak. So here's how it works. Shadow banking is made up of financial entities which function like banks but are not subjected to strict regulation like the banks. Like banks, they provide credit and liquidity, but they do not have access to central bank funding or safety nets like deposit insurance. Some examples of shadow banking, money market funds, private equity funds, hedge funds, investment banks, and mortgage brokers. So why aren't they subjected to regulatory oversight? Because they don't want to be. Um, they don't have to be. The, the idea of regulatory oversight for the actual banking system, the one that's out in the light that we think of as being uh, more publicly transparent, um, has a system that the Federal Reserve, for example, is a top regulator in the United States for that's supposed to oversee uh, the transactions, what happens between deposit and lending, how various practices go, and what their, what their books or the evaluation um, of their assets looks like at any given time, and are supposed to look for problems that might arise in those evaluations, how much capital a bank puts behind the bets it takes or the loans it makes, um, and that's all part of the technical non-shadow banking system. The key here is in the 1990s, the uh, regulations in the United States known as the Glass-Steagall Act were removed, and that act was repealed, and the uh, commercial banks which were by far the largest financial institutions and still are, they were then free to uh, use their deposit base, which was immense, to go into the uh, formation of institutions which would not be regulated. One of the biggest differences between shadow banks and traditional banks is that shadow banks don't take deposits. Instead, they rely on short-term funding provided either by asset-backed commercial paper or by the repo market, in which borrowers offer collateral as security against the cash loan and then sell the security to a lender and agree to repurchase it at an agreed time in the future for an agreed price. The shadow banking system is how all of that takes place, but not in the realm of traditional banks that are signed up to be regulated, that are signed up to take deposits and to have regulatory oversight and also insurance. Um, for example, in the United States backing those deposits. Um, and the reason it exists in the shadows is because effectively it, it's an opportunistic type of a business. Shadow banking also lends. It also borrows money. It also makes investments. It also bets on things and it also takes on risk. But the companies that do this um, choose to do it out of regulatory oversight. They don't register themselves. And the banks that are registered are actually okay with that as well because oftentimes one is a client of the other. And sometimes shadow banks are actually part of regular banks. They're components that you don't kind of see on the main books or the main balance sheet of banks because they're called different things or they exist in different countries off of the main books. And so that's why the main banking system has a shadow bank component and separate companies are totally shadow banks. What's happened is that um, traditionally banks do lending, they take in deposits and make loans, but what's happened is there's been this growth of something that's termed the shadow banking system, whereby they don't actually take deposits in like traditional banks, but they raise money on the financial markets, and then they make loans. So they actually bypass a lot of the regulations that the banks face. Um, so what you can do is something called a structured investment vehicle, is you can issue short-term debt, and then you make long-term loans. So you actually go to the financial markets to raise the money. And uh, this kind of activity is less regulated. Confused? Well, you should be. Let's continue with the textbook definition of shadow banking. Shadow banks, which are often based in tax havens, invest in long-term loans like mortgages, providing credit across the financial system by matching investors and borrowers individually 
or by becoming part of a chain involving numerous entities, some of which may be mainstream banks. The idea of shadow banking, and it's kind of a definition that was put upon it a little bit artificially. It's the idea of things that banks do or financial um, exercises that aren't overseen, that aren't regulated by official channels. Um, but an actual bank has um, different components of it that act in these sort of shadowy channels. For example, they can create uh, things called investment vehicles and what those are, are are places where they can buy assets, in other words they can leverage or, le or borrow money against the deposits, against people's deposits that they do hold, they can borrow money against those deposits, they can buy other assets and they can stick them off of their main books. Well as mentioned there, shadow banks don't take deposits and because of this they are subjected to less regulation than regular banks. Therefore they can increase the rewards that they get from investments by leveraging up much more than other banking institutions. And this can lead to risks. How about some examples? Citigroup was a major example of this. They had a lot of these investment vehicles not on their books. They were one of the first banks that came to the United States government and said, we need help, um, not because their main books were failing and the main subprime loans were failing, but because these special investment vehicles were beginning to fail. So they knew that. Today, the Justice Department attained a landmark civil resolution with Citigroup totaling $7 billion in fines and consumer relief to address the bank's involvement in a scheme to sell fraudulent securities that were backed by toxic loans. Now, this total includes a, a civil penalty of $4 billion, the largest penalty to date of its kind. Um, but the regulators didn't necessarily knew that, so they had to come and ask for effectively bailout money before uh, the main bailouts happened in the end of 2008. So in 2007, a year earlier, they knew what was in the shadows. The regulators didn't know or didn't ask. Um, for example, and this was a big example, uh, and will serve to illustrate, there was a hedge fund in the 1990s called LTCM, Long-Term Capital Management. And it was as though the world was behaving exactly the way it had been writ on the blackboard. Long-Term Capital, thought that they had discovered the path to nirvana. Here they are doing their day-to-day -day activities. A change in the market dynamics began to become apparent. That fund had capital of about a billion and a half dollars, which at that time was large for a hedge fund. It was loaned $140 billion, in other words, 100 times its capital, in loans from 55 banks all over the United States and Europe, most of them commercial banks. That is, they